Hi friends, welcome to another episode of Bite Size Biohacks. I am going for a little walk actually as I record this today. Um, continuing with the theme of hormones, I want to, you to understand about a special hormone. Um, it's actually a neuropeptide known as kisspeptin, which is really important in the context of fasting. And a lot of women don't know much about it. And that's why I wanted to really just feature it here on this little Bite Size Biohacks with a short clip from my episode with Dr. Stacey Sims, because I think people often get confused around fasting, thinking that more is better. And I think there's a common misconception that if you're fasting for, for example, 16 hours a day and keeping your eating window within eight hours, then you're stimulating that full cellular autophagy. And that's not actually the case, as you'll learn in a future episode that's coming with Dr. Joseph Anton. But essentially, to actually go into full cellular autophagy takes anywhere between 24 and 48 hours as a minimum, depending on the individual. And so if you're somebody who is, like myself, a keen exerciser and you exercise every day or, or most days of the week, then there isn't actually a benefit to doing extended fast. And actually, it can really mess with women's hormones, as you'll hear in this clip. And exercise itself is a fantastic tool for stimulating autophagy. So you don't really need to do both. In natural fact, pre-fueling for exercise with at least some essential amino acids can be very positive. So let me introduce you now to this Bite Size Biohacks with Dr. Stacey Sims. We like to say things like intermittent fasting, keto diet, all of those that are so popular, it's more of an elimination diet. <clears throat> and when you look from the big scheme of things, when you're eliminating things, your body is like, hey, what's going on? But if we disseminate it down to what's happening from like women versus men, and you see all these things on Instagram about intermittent fasting working and exercising, high intensity stuff, all this kind of stuff across the board. And when you're looking at that one shot in time, you're like, okay, I better do this. But when you start looking at the research and understanding the research, most of the research outcomes are based on male populations or sedentary obese women. And when we look at women who are exercising, exercise in itself is a fasted state. So your body is already doing everything that intermittent fasting touts to do with telomere length changes and autophagy, all of those things happen with exercise. So if you're layering exercise and intermittent fasting, then it's above and beyond the stress that a woman's body should handle. And a critical thing that happens is a perturbance in a protein called kispeptin. Now kispeptin is responsible for turning the endocrine system on and off. So for men, the threshold for the signaling on and off is so much higher than it is for women. So if women drop their calories and have a long period of time where they're not eating, then kispeptin gets perturbed and it's causing endocrine dysfunction. So you have thyroid that gets downturned, which turns your resting metabolic rate down. And you start feeling tired and fatigued. Your estrogen, progesterone, they start to be perturbed and you end up having more amenorrhea aspects or irregular cycles. And we're getting into the older woman set when you're in mid forties and you're already starting to have some turbulence in your hormones because of perimenopause and you're not eating and have increased cortisol from the stress of life plus increased cortisol from not, from not eating. All these things are perturbing kispeptin and then your endocrine system takes a big whack. And what a lot of uh, like natural therapists are saying, oh, it's adrenal fatigue. And it's not necessarily adrenal fatigue per se, but it's this whole cascade of things that are happening with your endocrine system that is starting to put your body out of whack where you are getting more tired. Your resting metabolic rate is going down. And because estrogen progesterone ratios are changing, you're starting to put on more of the serial abdominal fat. And no matter what kind of exercise you're doing, you're not going to be able to counter it. It's the food aspect and then the type of exercise that you're doing to work together. And there's so many people that don't think about it that way. Like, I'm going to follow this diet, and then I'm going to follow this exercise trend. But they're not thinking about it together in concert with how that also affects their daily life. Mm, yeah, I agree with that. And I think a lot of people are looking at it and going, well, the research on things like longevity looks so good on fasting, therefore I'm going to throw in fasting. Then I'm going to look at this type of exercise because that looks really good as well. And then, you know friends or I've seen people on social media who get really amazing results from the keto diet. So now I'm going to incorporate keto as well. And they start layering all these things on top, I guess, thinking that actually now that's going to give them more and more longevity benefits. Whereas actually, from what you're saying, it's completely overstressing their system. And I think you yep. mentioned in the course actually as well about how at this time, cortisol is naturally rising as a woman's going through perimenopause. 
she's getting greater levels of oxidative stress. Uh, and also she's now less insulin sensitive. So her baseline level of all these things is quite tricky. What's the yeah. reason for cortisol specifically? It's also that it's a really difficult time in many women's lives, isn't it? They're raising growing children who've got demands. They're at a point in their careers or profession where it's it's busy, right? They're almost at that peak, right? They've been doing what they've been doing a while. They've got lots of responsibility. And often then they've got aging parents at the same time to cope with. There's a lot of pressure on women, I think, in that kind of decade. But you're yeah. saying that like biologically, cortisol is also rising on its own. Yes. And one of the responses for having like lowered estrogen progesterone is cortisol is also a steroid hormone. So when your body starts having less estradiol and converting estrone, one of the byproducts of conversion of estrone is getting more cortisol. So by the nature of your estrogen, when I'm saying estrogen, I mean your estradiol dropping, which is our primary most powerful sex hormone then you're having this conversion of trying to get more estradiol. So estrone is converted to cortisol. Cortisol is being, being treated as if, okay, well, now we need to find a way to convert this to estradiol, but you can't. And so the cortisol levels keep coming up and up and up and up and up, and you start getting more estrogen dominance at different times. So the whole hormonal aspect of what's happening is so far removed from whatever a man would experience from stress mm -hmm. levels plus everything your body's going through as you're starting to hit menopause. I hope you enjoyed that short clip from Dr. Stacey Sims. If you'd like to listen to the full episode, it is episode 94, and it's all about the sex differences in training between men and women. And we dive into women's hormones, perimenopause, and also fasting. And look out for another episode, an updated episode that's coming with Dr. Sims very, very soon. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast so that you never miss an episode. That episode will be coming out in the next few weeks, so more on that. And also, if you're enjoying the podcast, if we can ask you to leave a positive review on whichever platform you're listening to, it really helps us to get the message out to a wider audience. Thanks again for listening and I'll see you next week for another Bite Size Biohacks. Please know that while I try to cover as much information to help you as I can on these Bite Size episodes, none of the things that I mentioned should be taken as a substitute for medical advice. And before taking any supplements or anything else, please consult first with your medical doctor.